of today will be open data for open finance. And I'm gonna give you, try to give you a brief introduction of uh, Web3 data. And um, maybe a little words about me. I have a business administration background, so I'm not that technical. Uh, I basically taught all of this myself using Dune. And uh, you can exactly do the same things. Uh, nowadays on Dune, I'm, I'm basically doing developer relations. So I make sure that every one of you who tries to query stuff on Dune uh, can actually do that. Um, so without further ado, um, what I want you to take away today is that Web3 data is radically open. Uh, it is fairly straightforward in my opinion, and uh, it really levels the playing fields. And we will get into what each of these topics mean in a bit. Um, so maybe, who has traded on a decentralized exchange in the last month? Okay, okay. So you've all made it into this picture, congratulations. Um, so this is the um, total volume of decentralized exchanges over, um, I think, the last 30 days. And what that shows you that uh, on Web3, we can do very big data aggregation. And we can break this down into uh, individual projects. Um, wow, the colors come out weird. Um, so the, yeah, the purple bar is Uniswap. It's not the Uniswap pink. Um, well, basically, you can see that Uniswap dominates um, the entire decentralized exchanges market. And um, then we can even go down to individual pools. Um, so this is only, like it says in the top left corner, um, all decentralized uh, exchange trading pools um, and only using the USDC WETH trading pair. Um, so we can really, um, we can go all the way up and uh, look at the entire um, decentralized exchange volume of all the different exchanges and we can go all the way down um, to just looking at the single pair and then even um, looking at things like, hey, which Uniswap v3 um, uh, fee pair? Um, so Uniswap v3 now has different fees, uh, how do you, fee tiers. Um, so obviously the 0 0.05 uh, tier is high up there, but uh, surprisingly the 0 0.30 zero, uh, percent tier um, is still ranking second overall on that um, training pair. So that really shows us how um, dominant Uniswap v3 really is in the decentralized exchange market and especially in these very liquid pairs. Um, so now um, we can even go deeper than that. And um, this is basically just the individual traders over, I think this is the last night pretty much. Um, and yeah, like if we want to do this, we can really go all the way down in uh, Web3 data. And this is something that I can do for all different projects. So that is pretty radical. Um, so what that brings us to is that everything is super public. You can't hide anything. So um, I can do this for Uniswap, I can do this for Curve, I can uh, make comparative analysis. Um, yeah, I can basically like take the values or take the different products and directly compare them to each other and there's nothing that my competitor can do to stop me from actually analyzing their data. And that that's what I mean by everything is super public. If something fails, you fail in public. If something does well, uh, you, can, you can just like show your data and everyone can verify that the data is correct. Um, yeah, that means you can learn from your competitors so you can just see like, hey, um, somebody has launched like a very similar product, like how is this working out for them? Um, you, you can also analyze your users. So in, I think in the crypto space in general, we think of wallets as fairly impermanent and everybody is like switching their wallets all the time. But actually if you like dig down into the, into the actual data, it turns out that uh, wallets are actually fairly permanent and we can make some big assumptions based on the wallets that are using my protocol. Uh, am I attracting new users? Am I attracting uh, advanced users? Am I attracting like first time DeFi users, people who only come from the NFT space before? We can do all of that stuff um, with this public data. Um, and one very fun thing is uh, if you don't deal with your on-chain on data, someone else will. And I'll go into a little bit of a case study. Um, so everybody knows Luxray, I guess. Um, for those who don't know, Luxray is a new NFT marketplace which is basically rivaling OpenSea. And Luxware was incentivizing uh, trading volume by subsidizing, uh, uh, so each Ethereum or each um, yeah, metric of volume that you traded on a platform basically got rewarded uh, in Luxray tokens. And 
uh, they were using this formula, so basically um, there's a set amount of tokens in a day and however much volume you make up of that day, um, you get uh, uh, tokens in, in that amount. Um, so what then happens is we get something like this. So this is the um, daily NFT, so yeah, the eight daily NFT trading volume. And if you look at this, you would think that, hey, looks where has is actually a valid competitor to uh, to OpenSea, and they're really doing great. And OpenSea's uh, OpenSea's probably sweating their ass off, and like this, <laughs> um, this is a I don't know hairy situation for OpenSea or something. But then, um, if we actually dive down into the data, data, and that's what I mean by you can't hide, um, we can we can take a look at uh, a very simple query on Dune, which is basically. Uh, looks rare, zero royalty volume, and what that means is um, in NFTs there's this concept uh, of royalty, which means that on every transfer of the NFT um, after it has initially been minted, the original creator can take a can take a cut of that uh, of that transfer basically or of that sell event, and um, basically there's also collections which don't have this royalty. And so if you want to uh, wash trade on Luxware, so that means uh, bringing a lot of volume through Luxware. Um, you would basically use these uh, zero royalties, uh, zero royalty collections. And um, as we can see, um, so the red or orange bar um, is the zero royalty volume. The blue, um, the blue bar is the like all sales volume. And the little uh, gray bar here at the bottom is what's left. So. We can see that for most of the last month, um, the volume of Luxware was actually just fake. Um, so it's just uh, wash trading volume, or at least we can, like, there's still some cases, there's very little cases where a zero royalty, vol like, zero royalty collection will actually be traded in a legit way. Um, but just like a back of the envelope can, uh, calculation that we can make here, um, most of the volume uh, was fake. In the recent days, it has actually gotten better, but. Uh, it's still uh, mostly fake volume. Um, so this also reflects in the users. Um, so again, you can't hide. Um, OpenSea has like 50K daily users and uh, looks where it's sitting at like, I don't know, 500 to 1,000 or something. Um, and then if we actually apply that wash trading filter to the overall volume, so uh, we were looking at this earlier, um, you can see the uh, yeah the relation of the, of the bars of looks where and OpenSea is, um, yeah, it's a, it's a joke right here. So you can't hide. Um, this was a very smart move by Luxware um, to, I, I don't know if it was a bug or a feature or what they were thinking about this, um, but basically if you only, so if we don't analyze the data in depth and we're just like, yeah, like Luxware has this much volume now, then if Luxware was the only owner of their data, so how it is in Web2 most of the time, um, then uh, like investors into Luxware would probably be um, on top of the moon, um, they they'd be, yeah, they'd be very happy about the market share that Luxware was able to take in such a short amount of time. But then, if we actually dive dive into the data and uh, yeah, filter out the wash trading volume, um, yeah, it looks pretty shady. Um, but this story is not over yet. So um, yeah, this is a bit unrelated. But basically, there's this thesis that aggregators, so um, things like Gem and Genie, uh, in the NFT market could um, potentially lead to looks where having a higher transaction count. Um, but if we look at the market share of, so this is all the different transactions um, in the NFT market um, normalized. And uh, we can see that, uh, yeah, Gem makes out like seven, eight percent of the total uh, NFT, yeah, NFT transactions at the moment. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll see how that story plays out. Um, but yeah. Uh, Web3 data is radically open. You can't hide. Um, that's basically what I want to show you with these slides. And then, in my opinion, uh, Web3 data is fairly straightforward. So how does all of this work, actually, in the background? So how do we, how do we get to all of these cool charts? Um, so there's, like, I'm going to really butcher this. And if there's any, like, <laughs> proper developers in the room, they'll probably hate me. Um, but. Ethereum is a state machine. Um, every transaction has clear data elements, um, and smart contracts produce logs. And that's basically like all we need to know. We're just analyzing the outputs of the Ethereum virtual machine, and that is basically just a runtime environment, which is in some ways a computer. Um, so 
if we look at this, so this relates to Ethereum as a state machine. Um, so basically what we're doing is, um, so on Ethereum, so let's say I have um, 20,000 DAI in my, uh, in my wallet and basically all, all that is is somewhere in the DAI, co uh, in the DAI contract storage, there's, a, um, there's an entry with my wallet and um, uh, 20,000 in a non-decimal form. So it would be like, yeah, I don't know how that number looks like, but um, basically it is nothing else. And if we want to change that state, so if I say uh, I want to transact DAI, uh, DAI, then I send a transaction to the, to the DAI smart contract and I say, um, yeah, please send my DAI to um, this other address and um, that's how we change the state um, of the system. And um, state changes can only happen one by one. Um, yeah, transactions in Ethereum are always uh, run sequentially. And um, yeah, <laughs> you, might, you might now think uh, it's pretty easy to analyze all the state data on Dune, but uh, we don't have state data yet. Um, we're working on it and um, there's other teams in the space who've actually done this, um, but doing it right and doing it uh, in a scalable way and so that our database infrastructure um, keeps running along uh, is very hard. So what we do instead is um, we can analyze the transactions. So instead of um, analyzing the state, um, we analyze transaction. So a transaction always has input data um, and that input data basically uh, makes some gears turn inside of the EVM. And then um, that might, um, so, so uh, let's stay in the DAI example. So if I successfully transfer my DAI, um, then the DAI contract will spit out an uh, event lock which is, um, which is just called uh, event transfer. And it basically says I've moved um, this amount of DAI from this address to this address. And using these locks, we can actually replicate all of the states on Ethereum. Um, sometimes easily, sometimes it's a bit harder, uh, but most of the time it works. Um, and then there's also the thing which is called an internal transaction. So that would be, um, for example, if I, um, if I send USDC, the USDC contract will first um, query a blacklist. So there's a blacklist contract and uh, the USDC contract will call that blacklist contract and ask if one of the addresses um, which is trying to transact here uh, is blacklisted. So um, that's what happens during internal transactions and it's a very simple example. Sometimes there's like, uh, yeah, literally hundreds of internal transactions that happen during one transaction. Um, but in general, um, this is just this is just a loop that can uh, that can infinitely uh, not infinitely uh, for the amount of gas you have, um, but it can go on for quite a while. Um, so yeah, so basically we have four data components and one is state. So what's the current state of the system? Um, then transactions. So that's basically the first call I make into DVM, and that's who's trying to do what. And then we have internal transactions. So that's what happens inside of the transaction. So if there's more steps, um, which, which gears also start turning inside of the EVM. And um, then we have event logs and the event logs are by far the easiest to analyze for, for people on Dune um, because they are very reliable. Every time a, uh, something happens, um, we can just use that event log or uh, look at what kind of logs the smart contract has emitted and then we can analyze that transaction using the logs. Um, so the logs are, yeah, they're designed um, to be, yeah, kind of indicators of what just happened in that transaction. So obviously that's gonna be the easiest way. Um, yeah, so um, how does all of this work on Dune? And I don't know, yeah, I think I have time. Um, so all of the methods to get the data are public. Um, once it runs, and runs forever. Um, so all of this is probably fairly opaque for, um, to somebody who is not familiar with Dune. Um, but um, standardization and abstraction happen on a macro level and social learning is absolutely OP. OP. Um, so let's quickly go into this. And basically what I've done here is I've written a short query and um, so uh, we're gonna look at the Uniswap v3 uh, factory event pool. Uh, so Uniswap v3 has a factory contract and that factory contract emits an event uh, that's called pool created and um, if we just run this query, um, so this is the Dune interface for anyone who's not familiar. On the left we have like a bunch of data tables. This is where we input our queries and uh, down here we can actually um, just get our results. Um, so now I have um, 
six six point five k rows, uh, uh, which all which show me all the pools of Uniswap v3 uh, that have been created. And I can see the feed here. I can see the tick spacing. I can see um, token zero and token one. So that's the and uh, the two components of the pool basically. Um, I can see which address um, the, the, the pool has and so on and so on. And basically, um, so this is already pretty useful uh, in some cases. Um, but what's the cool thing about Dune, so this is basically we are just replicating Etherscan here in the worst um, user interface, right? Um, but what's the cool thing about Dune is that we can easily aggregate these. Oh, how can I? That we can just easily aggregate all of this. Um, oh, that's very nice. Live querying is always the worst, guys. Um. Oh, come on. I didn't save my query. I'm sorry. There we go. Um, so basically what this is giving us now is um, how many Uniswap pools uh, have been deployed over time. Um, and this is also, this, this should just be a very uh, easy example of what you can actually do with Dune. Um, so we see that um, on each um, pool creation event, um, this, uh, yeah, this event lock uh, gets emitted and then we can just count them over time. And the same we can do with trades, the same we can do with if somebody deposits into a yield pool, the same we can do if somebody transfers something. And um, basically the power of Dune is that it just makes it very easy to um, analyze and aggregate these things um, so you can uh, extract data with scale out of the blockchain. Um, and then maybe if we wanna go one step deeper, um, we can actually run this. And so this is the different um, Uniswap v3 pools um, by, the, by the fee percentage. Um, so I don't know if there's any inter interesting data for someone in here, but um, basically the very low percentage fee pools um, seem to be pretty rare. Um, so I guess it's just used for stable to stable swaps, so it kind of makes sense. Um, but yeah, so, so this is how Dune works, and um, if we just go into some dashboard here, um, I just, um, I had all of these things like, um, once it runs, it runs forever. So that basically means once you've, um, once you've built a dashboard on Dune, uh, it just runs forever. Um, un until the, the code in there breaks, your query gets too long, or um, yeah, but both of those things should optimally not happen. Um, so basically, we just provide you infrastructure um, to build your own data hub for whatever you're trying to do. So if you're trying to analyze your own wallet or your project or um, I think in this case it's uh, ETH2 validators or no, ETH2 staging deposits. And um, there was another point in there, which is uh, social learning OP. So now, um, if I come on Dune and I'm fairly new and I wanna know how all of this works and um, how do I actually work with the data, I can just click into any query on Dune. <laughs> of course, this is private now. <laughs> what are you doing to me, Hildovi? <laughs> uh, Let's, uh, almost all of the queries on Dune are public. Um, it's actually very rare that, uh, that things are private. So usually I, I can just do this, and in that way I can just look at um, what this creator on Dune is doing, and um, so I, I can just uh, focus query, I can read through here and run individual parts so I can better understand um, how the whole system is actually working. So that's what I mean by social learning is OP. So, um, I learn best by just trying around, and I think a lot of people work that way. And on Dune, you can literally, you can go to um, world-class analysts, and you can just um, go into their dashboards, look how they work, and that way you can very easily level up your own game. Um, so yeah, um, so yeah, that's basically my whole spiel about Web3 data is, is fairly straightforward. There's a lot of people in the Dune community who didn't know SQL, who were barely able to read Etherscan, and after two or three months, um, they were legit uh, Web3 analysts and uh, are getting job offers left and right. Um, so it's a very, um, 
yeah, it's a very easy entry to a technical or kind of technical position um, in the space, I would say. Um, yeah, and my last point is basically Web3 data levels the playing field. And uh, it's, it's really radical. If you compare this to Web2 data, um, the amount of access we have with on-chain data into products and projects and companies uh, it's, it's basically, it's a, it's a whole new universe out there. Um, all of this data is public, um, you can't hide, like I said earlier, um, and if I make a private dashboard, I can literally have better access to a project's data than they have themselves. Um, so, so that's, it's such a radical new way of, um, of transacting and um, that everything is public and open. Um, yeah, it, it really, um, yeah, it really blows your mind if you think about it long enough. <laughs> um, so we have um, equal access for everyone, no paywalls. So in a traditional world, um, if you want to have um, yeah, in-depth research uh, access to a lot of the great data sources on this world, you literally pay millions of dollars um, a year um, to have that access. And um, in blockchains, it's all, it's all out there, it's all public, and um, you don't need to pay anyone. Um, yeah, Dune creators are building public and private goods. So we have a lot of dashboards which are just like general ecosystem statistics. How's Ethereum doing? How's, uh, how's the Polygon chain doing? How's optimism uh, adoption growing along? Um, those are all dashboards that are basically, um, they can be viewed as public goods, I, I think. Um, but also a lot of projects or um, companies are using our platform to just uh, take care of their own data. Um, and then, yeah, all of us literally have better access to data than the CEOs of Web2 companies, and that's really mind-blowing. Um, we have live reporting, it's not quarterly, it's not locked in PDFs. Um, we, can, we can share the data uh, between different analysts. I can look at what other people are doing on Dune and um, slightly change their approach. Um, it's really uh, going from the siloed Web2 data to Web3 data. Um, if there's data scientists in the room who are not yet working in Web3, you should definitely come and join. Like, it's, it's so much more fun. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, the data must flow. And uh, this is our Discord link. Uh, we will have swag with us uh, starting Wednesday. Um, it's still uh, being flowing in from Portugal. Uh, but oh well, uh, yeah, catch me, catch me at the hackathon or at any of the side events. And uh, yeah. I love it. The data must flow. Um, again, same question. Where, what, what are people going to get? What's the merch like? Do you, can you give us any? Uh, should we hunt you down really seriously? What is it? Aha! The yeah, greatest okay. socks in the world. Okay, Dune socks. <laughs> Worth it. Worth it. Um, okay, opening the floor for questions. Raise your hand. Hey, hi. Yeah, quick one. So speaking of competitors, I think the most important you or the biggest one you, you got is the graph. Uh, speaking of own uh, ex experience, so when we need to make the, some visualization, we do it in Dune. When we need to build our own uh, graph or something, we use the graph because it has bad API and stuff. So how would you com well compare yourself to them and uh, how do you plan to fight them? if you want. Well, there, there's enough space for everyone, always. Um, but yeah, how we see it is that Graph is more geared towards developers at the moment. So, um, and Dune takes more of the data science and historical data role. Um, but in the future, we have announced that we will launch an API. And um, yeah, we'll see how, how that plays out in the, in the long run. Question here. Um, so as the size of the data on Dune gets bigger, how do you plan on making it easier for people to do queries on the larger tables? Is there gonna be partitioning? Or is it just gonna be on the developer to select the correct materialized views I imagine you use uh, for the protocols that they're querying? Um, so on, on Dune, we actually have an abstraction layer. So we have tables that are called dex.traits and nft.traits. And in those tables, we have basically standardized and normalized and uh, joined uh, 
prices in US dollar and all of that good stuff. Um, and those tables are fairly easy to use for basically everyone. If you know a bit of SQL, you can work with that table because it's just, it's another SQL table. It's all already normalized and standardized. And um, in that way, we hope to open the field to a lot more analysts out there who are not that familiar with the inner workings of Web3. Um, so how the EVM works and, and all of that jazz, even though I don't think it's not that hard to understand once you like get into a bit. Um, but yeah, basically we're, we're, um, we're abstracting away um, complexity and complicated stuff um, from our um, yeah, data scientists already. And uh, we hope to scale those efforts up in the future. Hi, uh, it's a great talk. Um, so I know, I saw Dune just just finished ra uh, raising a $70 million Series B at a billion dollar valuation. Why, why does Dune need to raise so much capital? I saw that grin, <laughs> answer. Yeah, great, great question. Um, really putting me on the spot here. Um, no, actually, we are hiring. Um, <laughs> No, um, yeah, building a great team uh, with world-class people takes capital. And um, yeah, we, we are just committed to being the Web3 data platform to query for any data across any of the chains. And for that, we ne massively need to scale up our, uh, yeah, our, our personnel. Um, we raised one billion at only 16 people. And um, now we are already 35, so we are scaling very, very fast. Um, we are hiring the best people in all of, in, yeah, basically in all of our um, yeah, positions that we, that we have opened. Um, so go to dune.xyz uh, slash careers, I think. Um, and yeah, let's uh, help us spend that money. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Another question. And actually, it was $69.42. Really? <laughs> How did you get involved? What's your story? When did you join Dune? Um, I actually, um, I recruited myself over Discord. I just hung out in Discord all the time and uh, bothered Mats and Frederick with questions and reported bugs and so on. And after a while, they were like, hey, do you actually want to work here? Um, so that's pretty fun. What were you doing before? Um, I was supposed to write my bachelor thesis. <laughs> that did, that, okay, that did not happen. Did you submit something like, okay, now I'm, bye guys, or? No, I'm, I, I, uh, I, I'm still in, in, uh, I'm still enrolled actually. Um, at one point, I might convince a professor to just um, accept the Dune dashboard as a paper. Um, I hope that you happens should. in my lifetime, but uh, yeah, we'll see. You should, definitely. Um, any tips for any developers here? I mean, I think uh, your sort of, uh, your boldness of, you said hired yourself uh, in the Discord. Uh, any tips for people that are starting and what, what should they do? Um, just get involved. Um, yeah, the, the, Trent said the, the same yeah, thing earlier. The, the longer, the longer <laughs> is that story easy? is, what? Is it that easy? No, um, basically find something that you are good in. Um, so for me, I, I was in the space since like 2017 and I had been on Etherscan all the time and I kind of knew how a blockchain works and how like how smart contracts work and all that, all that stuff. And then I also had like SQL skills, um, which I picked up in some internship, uh, very random. Um, and then basically I just took those two skills, um, combined them and then basically there was very little other people who were as good as what I, I was doing uh, at the time. Um, and I, I found my unique um, position in the market, basically, that I could, uh, yeah, that I could work with. And um, I, I think everyone out here has some talent, or at least I hope they have some talents um, <laughs> that they can utilize. And um, basically, in Web3, you can almost create your own positions. Um, just like show up somewhere, um, ask, ask questions, um, do the do the like groundwork. Uh, answering questions in Discord is not the most fun um, task at the beginning, um, but you, like, actually it's, it's kind of fun. Um, like help, helping people out is, uh, is really something I like to do. Um, but it, it's not like a position that you would initially think is super interesting, um, but just do like the groundwork and over time you'll um, get access to, to better working opportunities basically. All right, last question. 
All right, thank you so, so much for this presentation. It was the first, I think, to have a, a Dune moment in Amsterdam. Thank you.